Good afternoon and welcome to Bible Ministries International's Sunday Bible Study. Let's begin by asking God's blessing upon the study as we open up the Holy Scriptures. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to be able to open your word. And we pray as we do so that you might lead us into truth. And we ask all of these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. This will be a Christmas devotional, Psalm 150, Part 5, and today's date is January 21st, 2024. In today's study, we want to focus on the last term in Psalm 150, of his might. All references are from J.P. Green's KJ3, unless otherwise noted. The transliteration method used is that of Davidson's Hebrew Primer and Grammar. The objective of this current series is to understand the spiritual significance of true biblical praise and singing, which is mandatory for the child of God. We have chosen Psalm 150 to do this, in Hebrew, the title of the book of Psalms is Tehillim, plural, and Tehillah, singular. Additionally, our prayer is that this study might reveal how one can approach and unravel any verse in the Bible to see in which way it points to the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemption plan specifically, provided that it is God's timetable for revealing truth. There are four Bible study aids that we are using in this series. Number one, the Bomberg Ginsburg Hebrew text and the Greek New Testament or Textus Receptus. The theological word book of the Old Testament is number two. Number three, J.P. Green's KJ3 literal version. And number four, Ezekiel Margaluth's Hebrew translation of the New Testament. Let's consider the purpose for each of these study tools. The Bomber Ginsburg Hebrew text in Greek New Testament is the original language text that God has preserved and is authoritative. The theological word book of the Old Testament shows the entire word family that a particular Hebrew Aramaic word is a part of. This is extremely helpful and saves a great deal of time so one can spend time actually studying a word as opposed to trying to locate where it's found. J.P. Green's KJ3 literal version gives the consistent literal rendering of any Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek word. This is key because it pinpoints how God employs this literal significance instead of all its nuances in the biblical languages. Lastly, Margaluth's Hebrew translation of the New Testament enables the earnest Bible student to find a bridge for most, if not all, words from the New Testament to the Old Testament and vice versa. Here is Psalm 150, verse 1, again in Hebrew with the English underneath. Praise Jehovah, praise God in his holy place, praise him in the expanse of his might. There are 13 references to praise in the psalm, pointing to the time of the end. Three of those 13 references single out each of the persons of the Godhead, Jehovah, God, and Him. Of His might is the first of three of God's attributes that are discussed in this psalm. The other two, as we will discover, are His mighty acts and His excellent greatness. Let's take a closer look at this term of His might in Hebrew. 
Remember that the two dots, which should actually be two diamond shapes, mark the end of every verse, not every sentence in the Old Testament, and are called the Sof Pasuk. The vertical line that always precedes the Sof Pasuk is the disjunctive accent Saluk. Below you will see Theological Wordbook number 1596, the verbal root for this word family, along with its five derivatives or stems. As you can see, our term of his might in Psalm 150 verse 1 is 1596b. For now, let's focus on some of the ways that God uses the verbal root 1596, which is to be strong. Then we can take a closer look at 1596b. Please remember to read the verses in their respective chapters to get the overall context, which is always important. I'll do just that with this first passage, which is verse 19 of Psalm 9 which is translated as let have strength to the chief musician to die for the son, a Psalm of David. I will give thanks, O Jehovah, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful acts. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will praise your name, O Most High. In turning my enemies to turn back, they will stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my justice and my cause. You sat on the throne judging right. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked one. You have put out their name forever and ever. The desolations of the enemy are ended forever. And you have uprooted the cities, their memory has perished with them. But Jehovah abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall judge the peoples in uprightness. Jehovah also will be a refuge for oppressed ones, a refuge in time of distress. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Jehovah, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to Jehovah who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the nations, for he remembers them, the ones seeking bloodshed. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted one. Be gracious to me, O Jehovah, see my affliction from ones hating me, be lifting me up from the gates of death, so that I may declare all your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk into the pit they made. Their foot is taken in the net they hid. Jehovah has been known. He has executed judgment. The wicked one is snared in the work of his own palms. A meditation, Selah. The wicked ones shall be turned to Sheol, all the nations forgetting God. For the needy one shall not forever be forgotten. The hope of the poor ones shall not perish forever. Arise, O Jehovah, do not let Man have strength. Let the nations be judged before your face. O Jehovah, put fear in them. Let the nations know they are but men. Selah. This is a messianic psalm as we see David exemplifying the Lord Jesus Christ. We note Christ's just plea for mankind to not have strength but rather to be judged by God. By reading the entire chapter, what becomes very evident is the distinction 
between how God deals with his beloved saints as well as those whom he has not redeemed. The former, like Jacob, are the unworthy recipients of the Almighty's gracious favor, mercy, and protection. The latter, likewise, are the equally undeserving beneficiaries of many earthly blessings, like Esau. However, for God's own purposes and according to his perfect wisdom, he has seen fit to pass them by with respect to salvation, as Romans 9, 11 through 13 firmly establishes. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of the one calling it was said to her, the greater shall serve the lesser. Even as it has been written, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Here are a few other verses to look up that help us understand the other spiritual implications embedded in this verbal root. The context of verse 13 of Proverbs 7 has to do with one that is naively snared into a false gospel in which this term is rendered, she hardens. And she seizes him and kisses him. She hardens her face and says to him. Let's consider one other passage in Judges 3.10, in which Judge Othniel defeated the king of Mesopotamia. This word is rendered here as had power. And the spirit of Jehovah was put on him, and he judged Israel. And he went out to war, and Jehovah gave Shushan Rishatham, the king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand had power over Shushan Rishatham. So once again, we see an army exemplifying God's elect in view, which reminds us of Second Chronicles 20, when Jehoshaphat and the army of Judah sang praises and worshipped. This also ties into the heavenly army or host that sang praises at the Savior's birth. Additionally, we saw this in part four with respect to the jubilant singing and dancing with musical instruments in Exodus 15, two to three, after the crossing of the Red Sea or the Sea of the End in God's victory over Pharaoh and his entire army. As we continue exploring each of the words in Psalm 150, we will encounter other passages that relate to singing armies, a picture of the Bride of Christ. Additionally, we will discover six different musical instruments as well as dancing. We wanna pay special attention to the sounds these instruments produce, which is akin spiritually to declaring God's word or prophesying. The sounds that these instruments and singers make also correlate with 1 Corinthians 14, 6 through 11, that explains the significance of sounds or singing, which has to do with vibrations and frequencies. But now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in languages, what will I profit you? If not, I speak to you either in revelation or in knowledge or in prophecy or in teaching. Likewise, lifeless things giving a sound, whether flute or harp, if they do not give a distinction in the sound, how will it be known 
what is being fluted or being harped. For also if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will get himself ready for war? So also you, if you do not give a clear word through the language, how will the thing being said be known? For you will be speaking into air. So it may be many kinds of sounds are in the world, and not one is without distinct sound. If then I do not know the power of the sound, I will be a foreigner to the one speaking, and he speaking in me a foreigner. Let's now examine the term 1596b of his might found in Psalm 150 verse 1. By far, this expression contains the most references of all the stems in this word family. It is rendered primarily as strength, strong, power, and might, as in Psalm 150, verse 1, of his might. Once again, God is focusing our attention on the greatest event in the Old Testament, namely the crossing of the Red Sea, or the Sea of the End, and the subsequent song of triumph expressed in Exodus 15, 2, and 13. My strength and song is Jehovah, and it happened he was salvation to me. This is my God, and I will glorify him, the God of my father, and I will exalt him. In your mercy, you led the people whom you redeemed, you guided in your strength to your holy dwelling. Isaiah 12, 2 employs the identical words for my strength and song in Exodus 15, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for my strength and song is Yah Jehovah. Yea, he has become my salvation. First Samuel 2 records part of Hannah's paean of praise to Jehovah, and in verse 10 this term appears as strength. Of Jehovah, one striving against him will be smashed against him. He thunders in the heavens against him. Jehovah judges the ends of the earth and gives strength to his king and he exalts the horn of his anointed. The context of 1 Chronicles 13, 8 has to do with the return of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. When David invited all of the tribes to witness this very special event, so they played their musical instruments with exuberant rejoicing and fervor to accompany this monumentous event. Our word is translated as might, emphasizing the tremendous passion that was conveyed through their playing. And David and all Israel were playing before God with all their might, and with songs, and with lyres, and with harps, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. I would also like to point out that 1 Chronicles 13.8 contains three of the same instruments out of the six which are mentioned in Psalm 150 verses 3 to 4. Additionally, please note the four references out of nine total in Psalm 150 to praise him. Praise him with the sound of the ram's horn. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Second Chronicles 30 is a chapter that takes place during the reign of good King Hezekiah when they celebrated the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread that had not been done so with such fervor since the days of Solomon. And the sons of Israel, those found in Jerusalem, 
kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great joy. And the Levites praised Jehovah day to day and the priests with instruments of strength before Jehovah. Here are a few more illustrations of how God uses this term. Psalm 62, 11 affirms, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that strength belongs to God. And in Psalm 77, 14, we read, You are the God who does wonders. You have revealed your strength among the peoples. And Ecclesiastes 8.1 poses this question, who is as the wise one? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and by might his face is changed. Jeremiah 16.19 states, O Jehovah, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The nation shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only lies, vanity, and there is no profit in them. Please note the word that follows my strength in Jeremiah 16, 19, which is, and my fortress, or meos, of which the main word is our word for strength, os. The prefix mem that precedes it denotes a place, which is why it is translated fortress, figuratively, referring to the security and strength found only in the Godhead and in God's word. On the other hand, Ezekiel 24, 21 paints a very different spiritual portrait. Speak to the house of Israel, so says the Lord Jehovah. Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pities, and your sons and your daughters whom you have forsaken shall fall by the sword. Our last scripture is Psalm 8, 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have founded strength. Because of ones restricting you to cause to cease the enemy and the ones avenging. Once again, this word is rendered strength. What's interesting about this verse is that it is quoted in the New Testament in Matthew 21, 16, bringing us full circle back to Psalm 150, in which praise or hallelujah is repeated 13 times. And they said to him, do you hear what these say? And Jesus said to them, yes. Did you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise. In our next lesson, we will be examining the musical notes and melody in Psalm 150 verse one, as God permits.